Maidan, the name of a square in the centre of Kiev, also known as Independence Square. Maidan also now shorthand for the revolution that turned Ukraine upside down five years ago. For three months, it was the setting for huge demonstrations, then riots, all in the name of the European dream. It all began on the 21st of November 2013. The Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych announced that he would not sign an agreement which had taken five years to negotiate between his country and the European Union. Yanukovych in favour instead of closer ties with Russia. At the time, Ukraine, it must be said, on the verge of bankruptcy, owing Moscow a huge debt of $17 billion for natural gas. But the president's decision provoked the extreme anger of pro-Europeans who took to the streets. At the end of the month, anti-riot police charged demonstrators, the violent images angering the international community and reinforcing the movement back home. December the 8th, and a huge event brought a million people out on the street. But President Yanukovych dug in, Ukraine's parliament passing a law banning demonstrations. With these foolish laws, Yanukovych proved to everyone that he is scared of us and he is using his last strength to keep the power, but he will lose because there are millions of us. I'm here because I want to live in a free European country. I don't want children to be beaten. I want the power to listen to the people and not adopt such a bad law. Clashes with the police, though, became more and more violent. By February, a real guerrilla war. And for the first time, police fired live ammunition at protesters, the violence causing more than 80 deaths in just four days. Finally, under extreme pressure, President Yanukovych fled during the night of the 21st of February, finding refuge in Russia. Since the victory of the pro-Europeans, Moscow flexing its muscle by annexing Crimea and backing the separatist uprising in eastern Ukraine, fighting there, claiming so far more than 10,000 lives. Well, five years on then, Gulliver Craig, who reported at the time from the Troubles for France 24, revisits Maidan for us. Kiev's central square has more or less returned to how it was before the upheavals of five years ago. Apart from the van advertising tours of the former president's mansion. And the exhibition recalling the events that led him to abandon it and flee the country. And then there are the memorials to the protesters who were killed. Yevhenia Zakrevska is a lawyer representing their families. The investigation is still ongoing. Zakrevska favours taking down some of the monuments in order to stage a full reconstruction of what happened. Here is where Ostimo Lodnyuk died. Over there, not far away, Yevhen Kotskyar died. In order to prove who shot them, we need to recreate the events in such a precise way that no one can have any doubts. Roman Varenitsia was sitting here. Video shows how he was hit by two bullets. This is the trace of one bullet, and this is the second one. Roman Varenitsia was 35 and from Novoyavorivsk in western Ukraine. He went to Kiev when the violence, well, that is, the most intensely violent phase had started, to support those people and not let them be dispersed. Roman's brother Victor lives just opposite the town's monument to the fallen. In practically every town and village now, there are people who gave their lives for Ukraine to be without corruption, free and independent. In a nearby village, Victor's parents' home contains its own small memorial to Roman and all those who died on Maidan. Here are some pictures of Roman's mother getting his prizes from the president. And here are the hero of Ukraine medals. 
But though Mihailo and Hanna are proud of their son, they're not impressed with Ukraine's president, Petro Poroshenko. Some things have been done, but very little. Of course, we're not satisfied with the current situation. We are unsatisfied, just like all ordinary Ukrainians are also unsatisfied with this life of poverty, because there's no other word for it. Many poorer Ukrainians feel they've yet to benefit from reforms, whilst politicians remain ostentatiously rich. In terms of what could be done to honor the memory of those who died on Maidan, the best way to show them respect would be to finally end all these corrupt practices. To do his bit, Victor joined the new reformed patrol police, Western equipped and trained and supposedly free of the corruption that plagued its predecessor. <laughs> Since this new police force was created in Viv, I haven't heard of any accusations of our police officers taking bribes. To me, that's a big achievement. It's a drop in the ocean of the progress we want to see, but at least it's something. This is the most visible reform carried out in Ukraine since Maidan. But the patrol police's powers are limited, and so are salaries, at around 300 euros a month. It's no secret. A lot of officers are quitting. You can look at the statistics. Some can't cope with the hours. Others find the money is not enough. People have different life situations. Instability and war hit Ukraine's economy hard. GDP shrank by more than 15 per cent and the currency lost two-thirds of its value. Artyom Lemar recently moved to western Ukraine for work. Back in 2014, he was among the riot police that faced down protesters on Maidan. One of a rare few who agreed to share their views with reporters at the time. This is going to go down in history, but that's all it will be, history. Artyom is no longer in the force, but his opinion hasn't changed. I think it would definitely have been better if Maidan hadn't happened. Well, they got the EU association agreement, but did life get better? No, it just got harder. Both from eastern Ukraine, Artyom and his wife say they're happy here in Ivano-Frankivsk, in the staunchly pro-European West. Yet they still have their reservations about the country's geopolitics. The majority wanted Europe, and they still do, evidently. And you? I'm not so sure. The EU's conditions, which the previous president refused to accept, are now being met. And one of them is raising utilities prices in Ukraine up to the level of European prices. But no one's bringing Ukrainian salaries in line with European ones. Artyom now works in a cement factory, often doing night shifts. A fellow commuter also voiced mixed feelings about EU integration. The problem is no one wants to work here anymore. Everyone's moving there. Low wages are driving emigration. But Artyom's quite happy with his job. The company's territory extends even further over there, beyond the railway. It's a huge factory, growing, so right now it's a nice place to work. Recently, President Poroshenko described this factory as a shining example of the success of Ukraine's European orientation. But when we asked the company about its exports to the EU, they categorically refused to tell us anything. As Artyom was saying, Ukraine's Western creditors have insisted it raise heating prices. The aim is to stop corrupt officials from profiting from gas subsidies, but it's still a very unpopular move. All the more so in Novoyavorivsk, where for most of this autumn residents had no central heating at all or hot water. We take our biggest pans and we put them on the stove to fill up the bath with hot water. 
Thank God it's still quite warm outside, otherwise kids will start to freeze in their homes and get ill. An alarming situation, but it is the result of real action being taken against corruption. The assets of the local energy company have been seized because its owners were stealing gas. Ukraine's new anti-corruption organs placed two heat and power plants in the area under new management. But there was a problem. Here there were backup controllers. They're missing. And without those gadgets, this equipment can't work. The asset management agency accuses the owners of sabotage. They pretended this plant needed 10 times more gas than it does to heat the town, effectively stealing subsidized gas from the state. Now they're only thinking about how to avoid prison, them and their management. And if we can have this place properly managed for even just one month, that would be enough to compare how it ought to be with what they were doing and prove their guilt. They don't want that to happen. That's why they took those pieces away. The owners deny this. Their managers called a press conference in Kiev in order to blame the anti-corruption agencies for leaving residents in the cold. This company hijacked our plant, accompanied by the assets management agency and some unidentified men in black uniform. But civil society activists were also there and pointed out that there was actually a court ruling to take over the two plants while the investigation is ongoing. It's a simple question. Is that ruling currently valid? The rulings have not been overturned. The asset seizure has not been overturned. So yes, some of the action taken is in line with normal proceedings in a criminal investigation. But this is all happening with a certain little corrupt element. You know what the corrupt element here is? Stealing gas that would have been enough to heat the town for five years. After a raucous meeting, the activists felt they'd scored some points. The key thing is that they admitted who the owners are, who appointed those managers. They tried very hard to avoid naming them, but in the end they did. It's the Dubnevich brothers who are MPs for President Poroshenko's party. This was the classic Ukrainian corruption scheme. They'd buy gas at a subsidized price, and then, instead of using it for heating, they'd sell it at market rates. We first met Vitaly Shabunin in 2014 on Maidan. He was hiding from President Yanukovych's thugs after exposing his corruption. Five years on, he's fighting graft among the post-Maidan elite, who appear to be fighting back. In July, associates of the interior minister attacked Vitaly with green dye. He suffered chemical burns, and this is just one of 55 violent attacks on activists in the past two years, three of them fatal. The police and courts generally fail to take any action. One time, Vitaly's frustration got the better of him. Are you the guy who reduced my colleague to tears? Saying she had no right to rest when there's a war on and all that. That was you, yeah? And then the justice system suddenly sprang to life. Vitaly faces up to five years in prison for assaulting Vsevolod Filimonenko, who describes himself as a blogger and journalist, but is mostly known for harassing civil society activists. What's strange is how he always seems to know where to find them. He appears to have information that only the security services could provide. That's why we're convinced he's a paid provocateur, and that without the assent of the general prosecutor, the head of the secret services, and I think even the president, we would not be subjected to this ridiculous circus.
Wearing a Petro Poroshenko mask, Sevolod mocks Vitaly's allegations. He films everything as though it were a satirical show. But this is a real trial. Nevertheless, Vitaly is confident he won't go to prison. He stresses that this is not the same level of persecution that activists like him faced under Yanukovych. If those guys were still in power, then I would be in jail already, or I'd have my skull cracked. Really, there's been a huge step forward. Vitaly has been touring Ukraine to raise awareness about graft and galvanize civil society in the regions. He's resolutely optimistic about the country's progress. If you want to compare today's situation with what it was like under Yanukovych, it's night and day. The situation is much, much better. We've got an open business register, new anti-corruption agencies, and that trick with the subsidized gas that we saw, which is one of the commonest corruption schemes in Ukraine, that's simply no longer possible. Are politicians still stealing? Yes. But the scale is way smaller. Maybe people think it's the same or worse, but that's just because more light's being shed on it. Ukraine holds presidential and parliamentary elections next year. The results could determine whether the slow progress made since Maidan speeds up or goes into reverse. Bell of a crag revisiting Maidan for France 24. Well, that's all from this week's edition. Don't forget, of course, you can catch it and uh, all the previous editions as well on our website. That's at france24.com. More news coming up very shortly. Thanks for watching.